started the Southern Soul Swingers back in 2009, November 6th to be exact. Um, and, and there's a, you know, let me speak on that real quick. You know, the, uh, the guy who got that whole thing together, his name was Smiley the Scumbag or Smiley from Buena Parque. He's the one who got the idea together to get a bunch of um, collectors at the time who were like the shakers and movers in the scene. And keep in mind, man, this is like 2009, 2010. There's still plenty of music. I'm still doing my gangster harmony and I now become a Southern Soul Spinner member, you know? So uh, Smiley gives me a call, gives Ruben Molina a call, gives um, Solera 5150 a call. And then uh, Conejo was, 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 was hanging around too. So he, he we were the, the foundation of, uh, we all agreed and started and came up with the name, the Southern uh, Soul Spinners. Um, actually, if you want to get really technical, the first original name was Southern Soleros. Um, and then, you know, a month or two later, uh, it changed into the Southern Soul Spinners and uh, the core group still stuck around and, and started doing shows. Now, for me, it kind of worked out because, you know, it, it just felt like it was coming to this point in time. It was the first time ever in, in California, Southern California and Los Angeles mainly, that like collectors came together that were the shakers and movers, the ones doing things. And like, we kind of like formed like Voltron, you know? And like anybody who was anybody behind the scenes making big, like Arlene made a big name on YouTube. You know, Ruben, he's always had a big name, you know, with his books and his early concerts and just his knowledge of Chicano soul and just soul in general and just being the mentor that he has been to a lot of the collectors in, in the Chicano scene and, and sweet soul scene here in California, Los Angeles. And then myself, you know, doing the compilations, uh, we were still on social media, you know. Unfortunately, like, it, it would have been great to have you know, Sal Rodriguez or, you know, Robert Ramos a part of this, but they never joined uh, social media when it came out. Like, I think when Lost Soul fizzled out in the early 2000s, they kind of like stood low key as well. Like they never really popped up on um, any kind of social media platforms, period. So it was kind of impossible to find these guys, but it would have been amazing if they, if they were like involved with the, you know, the evolution of that. Um, so anyways, it's like 2009 and now I'm making my CDs and I've, I've become the Southern Soul Spinner. And now, you know, it's this whole new thing, you know, um, we're a bunch of collectors and we're like, yo, we're gonna play our music for the public audience, you know? So it kind of worked out because, you know, making these compilations and Arlene, you know, uploading her records onto YouTube, it just kind of, the other YouTubers would just kind of attack that, you know, and, and put it on their YouTube channels because it started getting scandalous and, and, and blown out of proportion. Like every time I would drop a new CD or anybody who dropped a new CD, it would just end up on YouTube and it would be shared by thousands of people and they would get, you know, not the credit, but they would, they would get the, uh, the they would get our music. And that kind of held true with Arlene uploading her videos. They would kind of copy the sound and maybe put a different picture up, but really Arlene was the one who like uploaded that picture. So in 2009, it was really Ruben, Arlene, myself, and uh, uh, really making the noise here in Los Angeles still. And um, it worked out for me, you know what? Because we kept discovering new records. We kept bringing to the table every week, man. We're winning records on eBay. We're, we're dealing with collectors. We're bringing new sounds to the audience. And we were like, you know what? We I remember at the table, we were kind of fed up like, you know what? playing this live for the people, um, even though the ultimate goal is to share the music with the people, we kind of decided let's share it for the music, this music with people in a live way and see how that works out. So we were running out BFWs. We ended up flying out to Chicago. We ended up going to Vegas. We ended up like, you know, becoming our own little like entity, like Voltron and, and uh, of collectors. And, and we created our own fan base live and um, we had like 300, 400 people show, coming to our shows, man, getting all dressed up and we were just playing the records. Now the beautiful thing about playing the records live for people was we kept bringing new content, right? New records to, to, to the scene, to new, brand new stuff that no one's ever heard. Stuff you can't hear on YouTube or stuff you didn't hear on the new CD because we kind of said, you know what? We got kind of fed up with our content ending up on YouTube 
and just you know put out there like that so we were like look if we play for the public they get to visually see us and they get to hear new music every time we do a show and you can't find it on youtube at the time and you couldn't find it on cds at the time because i stopped putting out certain songs on cd and arlene stopped uploading certain records and if you wanted to hear the new shit that we were that we were buying like because we were we, we were using facebook to, like, as teasers too like man you know arlene got like four new records man it's the fucking the shit oh i can't wait to play for you guys so we all kind of like bounced each other's energy like that on social media to try to to sell ourselves man george got that heat he fucking got like five new records in like can't wait to hear it and the only way you're going to be able to hear it is if you came to the southern soul spinner show and we played it live for you and maybe if you were recording it on your phone or like a, a you know vhs camera you might have captured the music but you weren't going to be able to upload it on youtube and like end up on a cd or end up you know the our music wouldn't end up on other people's stuff with other people's credit for it so that for me it worked out that way that's that's my opinion that's one of the reasons how i mean that's one of the one of the good ways how it worked out for me you know because um like i said it was kind of i was kind of fed up with everything ended up on youtube and it was really cool to like premiere my new fucking shit live for the people and it was dope it's just it was an overall insanely dope experience you know we did that for about three or four years and then that came you know obviously it came to an end like everything you know but uh, the evolution of the scene man i had my i was a part of that and um I think that's that chapter for the Southern Soul Spinners. And okay, so um, you know, while I'm being a Southern Soul Spinner in 2009, we're doing shows and we're doing um, you know venues uh, in about right at Christmas time into the year two, uh, 2011. You know, 2011. Uh, oh, not too many people know. At least now, the new the new scene, they really don't understand like all the things I've been through. Like, I had some of the craziest records of that era. Okay, let's just let's just anybody could vouch for that. And from 2009 to 2011 in LA, California, I was one of the guys with the craziest records in this box, straight up. Um, you know, I was bringing all that new shit to the table. You know, I was the one innovating and bringing the new shit that you guys never heard. You were learning it from me at that time down here. One of the guys, I'm not saying I'm the only guy doing it, but I was one of the guys that was bringing that shit to the table. So I had these crazy records in my box, these crazy rare records. And even for back then, they were crazy rare records. They were like 500 bucks a record, 400, a thousand bucks, one of them. Uh, and even that was like, that was like when records barely started hitting the thousand dollar mark, it wasn't that era. And not too many sweet soul records were hitting the thousand dollar mark for, you know, 2010 or 2011. It's just not too many that were doing that. Yeah, so this night, you know, I went to go to get tattooed my knuckles and I, I came back from scanning my records in at, at Danny's shop, you know, I, I wanted, we were doing a project and rather than just pick through my record box and, and pick those certain records, I didn't have time for that because I was in a hurry for whatever reason. So I just grabbed my whole box and I took it with me in my car, in my trunk. And this was earlier, like at five or 6 p.m. during the day. So we went to Danny's, did that, scanned in all the 45s. I put my records back in my trunk I went to go see um, Tattoo Nene at Sick Jack Studio. I got my knuckles tatted that night. It says soldier right here. And then I went home, called the old lady. Hey, what do you want the kids to eat? Bought the food. And I yelled at my nephews and his homie, like, hey, help me bring the food in because this is a shitload of food. Because my instinct was to pop my trunk and grab my records first and take the records in the house, right? So these these my nephew and his friend, they just darted out of the car, didn't hear what I said because they're blasting their iPod. And it left me to grab all the food and all the fucking containers and I'm out the car, shutting the fucking door at my foot and you know, all pissed off. And um, I'm knocking on the door and I go in and I put the food on the table, call her, hey, come and eat. And my intention was to go right back outside, get in my trunk and grab my fucking record box. And I live in a good neighborhood, you know, Covina, there's no gangs right there where I live. It's a nice neighborhood, but still, you know, it was just a really habit for me to just grab that record. Cause there was like, honestly, a 200 count record box. Everything in there was crazy. Uh, street value back then was probably 65K. Probably 65K. Probably 65K. Probably 65K.
Mm. Probably 65K in records, I would say. Um, from everything I accumulated over the years and if I was to put a street value on it. Because me and Nick, we used to, we used to, I used to every like once a month, you know, stack up my records and this is my $100 record pile. This is my $500 record pile. And they were like stacked up. And I used to just like, you know, evaluate my records and see what my worth was every now and then. So I had a rough idea of what it was. Um, so anyways, as soon as I was about to go outside, I get a phone call, right? So I answer the phone and I'm like, yo, what's up? And it's Conejo, you know? So he's talking, we start talking about some record he wanted to buy off of me. And we just start chopping it up. You know, it's 11 o'clock at night, I'm on Christmas vacation. I got work the next day, but still I'm chopping it up with him. I'm like, yo, what's good? Blah, blah, we're chopping it up, right? And I didn't go outside and get my records, right? So before you know it, me and Conejo, we're chopping it up to like, it's like midnight now. And I got my, my knuckles tatted and I, you know, you know, I, I go and take a shower and, and scrub my knuckles and, and all that. And I, after I hang up the phone with Conejo, I totally forgot about getting my records out of the trunk. I go in bed, put the, put the covers over me, I lay down, and then all of a sudden I remember. This is the part that kills me every time I think about it. Uh, my eyes are closed and I'm laying down in bed and I'm like, my eyes just open. Bing! George, your fucking records are in the trunk, fool. And I'm just like talking to myself like, oh, my fucking records. So right away I threw the covers off me. I'm only in my tank top and the boxers just got out of the shower. It's like two in the morning. And I get out of bed and it's fucking cold as fuck, bro. It was a cold ass night. And I was like, oh, hell no. Like, I ain't going out there. Like, I'll just get them in the morning. Like, I go to work in four hours, uh, three hours, you know. I'm tired. I'm just going to crash out. Long story short, um, I get to work. I tell myself I'm going to get my records out of my trunk. But I wake up late, right? I wake up late and I, I just rush in the car, jump in the car, and I jam to work. I didn't even think twice about the records because I was, like, really running late to work. And, um, you know, my eight o'clock break came around and I see the sun, the sun's rising already. It was a clear, hot day that day. And um, I'm like, fuck my fucking records. I go to my fucking run to my car, open my trunk and my whole trunk was empty. And I was just like, what the fuck? Like, who's playing a practical, like, who's playing a joke on me? You know, what's going on? I call, right away, I call the house. I'm like, hey, what the? Did you guys like empty my trunk out? Did my nephews go back in the car and like bring the CDs in or bring my record box in the garage? Can you check? I honestly thought for about a week and a half or two weeks, I swear to God, I thought someone was playing a practical joke on me because we used to watch MTV Punked. That's when MTV Punk, Punk was like all big. So I thought someone was trying to punk me, bro, for real. Like, some real shit. I was like, all right, all right. I know I'm getting punked. I was trying to go along with it, bro. And like after about three weeks, I was just like, I used to even ask, even a month later, I used to like look at my old lady at the time, like, are you sure I'm not getting, are you sure you like, are you guys really playing a joke on me? Like, come on, tell me, like, it's been a month already. Like, I was really trying to hope that it was a joke, man. And it took a really long time for it to really settle in. And yeah, man, I lost everything. My rarest shit, man. And, you know, I had to bounce back from that because that, that would have crushed anybody. And But, you know, I'm in it for the long haul, bro. Like. I was like, you know what, fuck that. I'm just gonna keep, I, all, I, all I could do is just keep doing what I know and keep going, keep collecting. Um, I was a, you know, I was, a, I was a Southern Soul Spinner. I was a collector playing my collection for people. So I was kind of useless as a Southern Soul Spinner, you know, and um, cause I didn't have no records to play. Uh, Rene Ruelas, one of my good friends, uh, he, who also was a Southern Soul Spinner, he gave me like a nice little healthy stack and uh, Everybody from the crew actually kind of helped me out. I remember Ruben gave me a stack of like some James Brown stuff. And everybody kind of like passed me a little stack, you know, hey brother, like fucking sorry, man. But you know, everybody kind of contributed the little stack. But I remember Renee gave me a really nice big healthy stack of some good shit. And it really like gave me the motivation to like get back in the game and like, you know, pick up some more heavy records. And it was a crazy long road, man. And I've never been the same because after losing all that, man, like, I didn't even care anymore. I could have lost whatever. That's why after that point, I really started selling records because I already, I already had that detachment. Um, I didn't really care anymore. Like if I could lose that, like I have no problem selling this record to you because I've lost worse, you know. So that's why I'm, I can really easily detach from a record as well. If I know it's going to go on to the next collector and they're going to appreciate it more than I do at the time, because sometimes I get all over a record, you know. It'll take me a year or two and I'm done with it. Like, I don't know, I'll just pass it to the next person who's going to appreciate it more. 
So I started learning that more. I was starting to, I always bought and sold my whole life through, by the way, too. I mean, I wasn't one of these hoarders. Uh, and nothing wrong with being a hoarder, but I just wasn't me. I've always, I've always sold and bought records to like get to the next record. You know, that's kind of how, because I'm not a rich man, you know, even though I was making money with CDs and all that, I had bills, I had five kids. Um, I had a lot going on uh, financially. Um, so I wasn't really like, even though I was doing okay, I wasn't really rich to like buy whatever I wanted. So I had to sell heavy records if I wanted that next heavy record, you know what I'm saying? So that was always my, the way I did it. And it was nothing to me to let go. Even to this day, that's why I do sold to me, you know, like now I really like have no problem with selling records to people and even heavy records, man. There's, I hear people say, how could you sell that record? I was like, I would never let that go. I'm like, trust me, bro. There's gonna be a point in your life for you to get to that point where you're gonna let go. Okay, man, so it's been fun. This is pretty much the gist of me, the core of me, who I am, how I started, where I'm at today, and, and how I feel about everything, you know? Um, so yeah, you can find me on Instagram at Vinyl Life. I have three different handles, but if you find me at the Vinyl Life, you'll see my other handles in the bio, but my other handles are Soul Supply Company, which is like my clothing line. And of course I have Gangster Soul Harmony, which is the page that's dedicated to everything related to Gangsters of Harmony. And the Vinyl Life is kind of like my personal Instagram, but I mix it up with all the other two handles, you know? So um, the Vinyl Life is probably the more active of the social media platforms that I'm on. I do have a website. It's also in the bio of my Instagram, but I'll say it out loud right now. It's gangstersoulharmony.bigcartel.com altogether. Those are my handles. Um, if you have any questions about who I am or any questions in general, want to ask me, just hit me up on Instagram. Uh, that's at the Vinyl Life with only one L, not two. And just DM me and be like, yo, I saw your interview and I have this question for you or that question. I'm always here to answer questions, man. So much love, respect to everybody out there. Keep the music alive by all means necessary. Uh, let's evolve and adapt with the scene and let's try to support each other. And, you know, if you can, if you can, after watching this, if you can try to keep it OG, man, I mean, that, that's just gonna make it that much tighter. But I understand the diversity in this. You know, everybody's in this for their own reasons. I'm, I'm just gonna be here being me and you guys just be out there doing you. And I have no animosity or no hard feelings with anybody out there, man. This is one big scene and let's all unite it and get it out there for the world. Peace.